Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the staff of the National Museum of Bermuda, we are delighted that you can join us for the second presentation in our Tracing Our Roots Routes program. Thanks to the generous funding and the support by our community of donors, individuals, foundations and corporations, and our membership, we were able to present this program free and accessible to all. It's a terrific opportunity for us to celebrate our shared history. My name is Lisa Howie. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the museum, and I'm the moderator for this event. I'd like to thank the entire uh, museum team who are working so hard behind the scenes to develop engaging programs, maintain the collections and museum grounds, and to sustain the future. If you like the program and the overall good work of the museum, please become a member today and donate through our website, nmb.bm. Just a few notes of housekeeping. Please be aware that this session is recorded and following the editing, it will be available on the National Museum of Bermuda website. Um, and that's a space that you can go back to for seeing and hearing again, perhaps, but also to share with the family and friends who may not have been able to come today. We welcome your critical feedback. So please complete our brief survey at the end of the presentation. Everyone should also have received the toolkit. And if you did not, be sure to tell us and we can email that directly to you. And again, the toolkit uh, is already on the website. Um, and, uh, and if you didn't get the toolkit from the previous workshop, please go there again for that too. Two final points that on the screen, you should all see the chat and you should all see a Q&A. We're gonna use the Q&A for quite literally that, for writing questions. And then we're going to use the chat for any technical issues and any resources that you want to share. We're aware that several of the um, people who've attended so far have done uh, quite a bit of research already. So they may have, you may have resources to share with all of us. So please go uh, feel free to pop that into the chat box. And if you have questions, please put your questions into the Q&A um, as you have them. And we will be doing our very best to manage as many questions as we can in today's session. So tracing our roots, uh, this comes about as we look at the key questions, where does your story begin and what legacy does it unfold? The program emerges from the, your, our community's growing interest in genealogy and we intend to give you the strategies and resources to research and document your family history. And we hope to help you connect in new ways to your past. The program itself is a series of online presentations, workshops and resources so that you can build your own sort of capability to effectively and sensitively research and to chart that family history as you find that information. In May, we will feature an on-site contemporary art exhibit under the same theme by the talented Jurday Hassel. And the program culminates with a crowdsource exhibit called Bermuda's Family Scrapbook, which will be displayed both online and on the walls of the museum. So please stay tuned for more and to find ways for you to participate. We hope that through the program, you will go away with the tools that you feel you can research your family for as long and as far as you wish to go, that you have the opportunity through the process to listen to other stories and, and develop a sense of inspiration, we hope, from those stories. And also to find out some other creative strategies for communicating your findings and your story itself. In the end, overall, our goal is to assist and encourage you to explore, honor, and preserve your family history. So today is the second installment of our two-part workshop that began last month with Kenyatta Berry, acclaimed American genealogist. And again, if you didn't see that presentation or you want to share it with others and its accompanying toolkit, please see the website for the Tracing Our Roots chapter. Today, we have the honor of hosting local uh, experts. Our theme today is the journey of family discovery to understanding local resources. We have local experts, Mandela Lightborn from Bermuda Archives, and we have Ellen Jane Hollis from Bermuda National Library, and Jane Downing from the National Museum of Bermuda. 
Our layout is going to be that because we have the three speakers, I'm going to introduce each one. Each has about five minutes to speak and uh, we'll produce, I'm sure, from, uh, from, from your interest sector, you know, questions. So please be sure to put those into the Q&A box. And so then it will come back to me to introduce the next speaker and we'll continue on with the presentations uh, until we reach your voices at the end. Right, so without further ado, let's move on to Mr. Mandelis Lightborn. Mandelis is an archivist with the Bermuda Archives. He has worked for the Bermuda government for 20 years, first as a teacher of history and English in the public school system, and then served as a records manager for the Government Records Center. He's a graduate of Alabama A&M, the Modern Archives Institute, and the University College London. Mandelis is passionate about modern and contemporary art forms, and he appreciates art and history of the 19th and 20th century. Welcome, sir. We're delighted to have you, delighted and I'll pass it here. over to you. Good. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, you can't hear me, right? Good, good. Um, yes, well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. I would like to discuss with you how the archives can assist you with your genealogical research and um, discovering your, your family history. Um, first of all, I'd like to, first I would like to discuss or talk about uh, the function and purpose of the, of the Bermuda archives, um, where we are located, how you can find us, um, what to expect when you arrive here. And then I will discuss briefly the, in brief detail, the four primary records that you can use with um, some supplementary records to discover your, your lineage, your family tree, your ancestry, um, and it will, these, the four, the four primary records are, I would, we would say the, the crux of what Bermudians use to discover their um, family history. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen with you and begin my presentation. Okay, everyone see that? Okay. Um, so, from the Bermuda Archives, assisting you with tracing your family roots. Um, so what is the Bermuda Archives? Um, essentially, we are the, the, archive, the, the archives of the Bermuda government. We're an agency within the Department of Libraries and Archives and uh, part of the Ministry of Education. Um, the purpose of the Bermuda Archives is to collect uh, and to preserve the legacy records of the Bermuda government that is our primary uh, remit. Um, secondly, uh, the, we collect the records of public figures, notable individuals, uh, Bermudian, those of Bermudian institutions that the appraisal archive is deemed national treasures. Um, along with that, we collect from private collections and donations or gifts, and in some instances, loans, art, photography, maps, and pamphlets uh, that document the various periods of Bermuda's history. Uh, we also serve a, as a, a role uh, as custodian for the three of the, the, the major historical societies on the island. The Bermuda Historical Society, the National Trust, and the St. George's Society. Uh, basically, they, their collection as a whole encompasses the 412 years of Bermudian history and is quite invaluable uh, to the people of Bermuda. Where are we located? Uh, we are located in the Government Administration Building on 30th Parliament Street uh, in Hamilton, in the basement floor. All of you are probably familiar with the building on, on the image on your left. Um, and when you come down the, the stairwell, as you enter in, you will see the entrance uh, if you see the double doors and the cedar door, you know you're in the right, the right place. Uh, you can notice our phone number there, uh, 2977, that is our direct number. Um, and that if you have any queries or questions, you can reach us. All right, so uh, the, the purpose and the function of the Bermuda Archives. 
Sorry, it said that. Uh, our facility. Um, our facility, our, we, our hours are 845 to 5, and the last record is pulled at 430. Uh, no appointment is needed, and there are no charges for services. Um, at the moment, because of COVID re restrictions, the, the room that you see in the picture on the left is our climate controlled reading room. And at the moment, we can safely occupy four persons. And in our in the, the picture on the left, you see our reading room that has the our technology, our scanning equipment, and our computer system, as well as our finding aids. We can house four people adequately there using COVID reg uh, restrictions. Okay, so when you arrive at the archives. Uh, we, at the moment, we expect you to be masked. You will sanitize your hands. You will sign in at our register. Um, you will secure all your personal items in a, in a locker. And then you will be asked about the nature of your research. Uh, for your genealogical research, um, the main questions that will be asked first will be those dealing with the names of the people that you want to start your search with. So all names, first, middle, and surname are important. Um, birth dates, marriages, and deaths, all of those dates uh, are important, mainly because they, in order to have a footprint, you will be either you will have a birth certificate, marriage, or death certificate. So if you have these particular records, um, it can verify or give you a, a base from which you can jump off and find other family members. Um, now, the parish of the individuals is, is vitally important as well because for the civil and church records, um, you will need to know the parish because of their the way that they are categorized and organized, um, the whether your family member was a, a parishioner of a partic particular church in a parish, or they were born in a particular parish when there were home births um, in the early 20th and, and, and the 19th century. Okay, so I said before the primary records that you will be using um, uh, the Anglican church records, which will include baptisms, marriages, and burials. Also available are the Methodist church records, uh, the St. Paul's AME church records, and the Presbyterian church. Uh, Bermuda Wills is uh, also a vital resource. Um, slave returns and registers, and the Registry General registers, uh, which stem span from 1866 uh, that we have in our collection from 1866 to 1950. Okay, first I want to talk a little bit about what primary records are. Um, primary records are those records that serve as an original source of information. Uh, this is mainly because the record was originally created to serve a business function or aid in providing a service before it became a source of research. Um, as in the, the four primary records that I will discuss briefly in a moment, they all served as a, they all had a function before they became uh, sources of research as a sort of a business function or to aid a government agency to provide a business function. Okay. So the 17th, 18th, and 19th century Anglican records. Um, in the collection, these records are only available on microfilm and transcribed copies of the registers are available uh, for the earlier records. Um, basically, ba we would like to just protect the integrity of the earlier records um, because they are unique and 
there are over, some of them are over 400 years old. The later records in the church register, say from about 1950, are able to be handled by the public. Um, these records were created by the Anglican Church during the period when the church served as an agency of the Bermuda Company, and later as the company dissolved the, as, a, as a colony of the British Empire. Um, these, reg these registers are the earliest records of birth, deaths, and marriages and burials in Bermuda. As I said, they, uh, some of them are over 400 years old. Um, the early registers dating from 1619 um, to the late 1700s. These ones are organized by parish or the rector of the particular church who would have um, chronicled these, the, the births, deaths, and marriages for that parish. Um, the entries are organized alphabetically and chronologically by, by a rector or parish for the 19th century. Um, the early registers are sparse, um, mainly because of the, active, the lack of activity and the, during the early period of, of the Bermuda Company, the church was just getting set up and it had not, um, it was only by 1621 that the, the church had been given the remit of becoming the agency to collect these, these, these records. The, after the Bermuda Company had been quite perturbed or upset that um, annual reports were not being sent back to Britain or England at the time. Um, but the 19th century registers are a more complete series of, of records. Okay, um, Bermuda Wills. These, within the collection, we have a near complete series of probated wills from the age of 1629 up into 1976. Uh, these, this record is a great source of genealogical information, mainly because it has the names of multiple family members, as well as some listings of property and possessions of, possessions of the family. But that depends on the particular the, the particular will. Um, we those are you can access those access access the later will books, but the wills from 1971 to 1976 are solely on microfilm. And if you wish wills from 1976 to the present, um, they are located in the registry of the Supreme Court. slave returns and registers. This is a very interesting um, and invaluable source of, of records, um, not mainly for Black or Bermudians of African descent, but um, because the, the registers include the name of slave owners and slave agents, it is a good source for um, genealogical information as well. The registers record the name, and in some entries, the last name of slaves, uh, the sex, the age, the hue of blackness, the occupation, and the birthplace and origin are also uh, included. Um, we, these records are really only available electronically um, or via microfilm when you arrive. Um, because of the, the age and the uniqueness of the record, um, it's because we like to preserve the integrity of the record. Um, oftentimes we do show them for exhibitions or if a um, historian is consulting them for more advanced or I could say complex research. Uh, the Registry General. Uh, these are these by far would probably say are one of my favorite records um, when conducting or assisting with genealogical 
research, genealogy researchers. Um, the, the, the way that the registers are organized um, are relatively easy. To, depending on the penmanship of the, the registrar, um, you can find a great deal of information there. Well, another thing that's pretty cool about them is that you can actually see the signatures of your relatives. Um, these registers became the official record of all births, marriages, and deaths when the Office of the Register General was created in 1865, thereby taking over the role of the, the church, the Anglican church. Um, the registers are organized by parish, uh, as I said before, and they are in date order next, but we have a series of indexes or indices that are organized by parish and you can um, access or locate families, your family members alphabetically by parish. Um, these records, as I said, are invaluable source, uh, one of my favorites um, for genealogical research um, is starting in the 19th century to the 1960s. After the 1960s, the Registry General began using uh, the A and B forms, which we use present, which they use presently. Um, most of you will be familiar with those because that is where your birth certificates are created from. Okay, I mentioned uh, additional primary records that you could use for supplementary information, and we have a large. Um, amount of records, or there are quite a number of records that can be used for supplemental information for locating family members. Um, it will take some research. Um, some, some of the records that come to mind that I haven't listed here are the books of miscellanies, uh, books of protests and bonds. Um, those are, I guess, if you want to do a little bit more advanced research, and you are aware that your family member may have made um, a, a protest or there's a possibility that there will be an interesting story, you can consult those books. Um, but for, for the moment for your primary research, the supplemental records that I have recommended here would be the church vestry land evaluation books if you would like to sort of get some context on property that was owned um, from the 19th century to the 1960s. Um, your regimental records are an interesting series. Well, with these records primarily, you will have to prove that you are a direct descendant or family member of the person that you are looking for uh, due to the, uh, some private information that are in these particular records. But our records officers can assist you with that. As I said before, that particular record series is very interesting uh, from 1899 to 1952. Um, land evaluation assessment records um, are, are a later record series. But for those, if you are looking for a name of that, if you are looking for an, the proper name of a relative, say you only have a first name, um, you can use these, but you are aware that a person lived, you can use these records to try and assist with, with locating names um, from that time period, if it's between the, the 1960 up until 2018. And then we have also have, we have the voter registration records, uh, which are also a later series of records from 1962 to 2003. Okay. Um, before I close, um, I just want to just go over some helpful points that I have, that I feel that will assist you when you come in to begin your, your family research. Um, first and foremost, as I said before, make sure that you have correct names, dates, parishes of family members in order to have a solid start. Use a concise family tree at first or organization, organizational chart. Uh, this will prevent confusion. 
um, keep it simple at first. And then once you have ample information, you can begin to condense your family tree. Um, get the right records for verification of names, dates if possible, births, marriages, um, those certificates, passports, if available. Um, try not to confuse family members or non-family members with the same name. This can happen when you use the civil records or the church records because you can come across the names of, of people that have the same names as your relatives. Um, but once you've established or you have a firm base, a base of family members, uh, ages and dates should clear up this confusion. Okay, and I edit this because this happens often. Um, something that you should be aware of. If the record is not in Bermuda, sometimes uh, it might be somewhere else. Sometimes when you are conducting your family research, you'll hit a roadblock or you hit a brick wall, as, as we call it. And in those times, it's good to find out whether or not the person was either born in Bermuda or if, the, if, the, if their parents left Bermuda and your relative was born somewhere else and then came back to Bermuda later on. Um, so the record could be in either the, the Turks Islands, St. Kitts, the UK, Canada, et cetera. Um, I have an asterisk beside the Turks Island because that is also another record series that we have here. It's not a complete series, but it's, um, it does have ample amount, an ample amount of information about births, deaths, and burials, um, births, deaths, and marriages in the Turks and Caicos Islands, those of you that have descendants in Turks, Turks and Caicos. Um, Lastly, make multiple copies as you update and add to your tree to prevent loss of information. Oftentimes people come in and say, oh, I, they need to look at records again because they um, have been missing, a file was corrupted or they've lost their paperwork. So print multiple copies, hard copies and save multiple digital copies on, th on thumb drives or on various drives to prevent this from happening. All right, um, so good luck on your journey. Um, we are we at the Bermuda Archives and the staff here are here to help you uh, with your journey of family discovery. Uh, you know where we are, so we look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much, Mandelas. I have several questions for you, but I will come back to those at the end. Hopefully we have time. Okay. Just so everyone's aware, we're making a transition now to Ellen Hollis. She'll be sharing her screen in a moment. Just, just a little bit about Ellen. She joined the Bermuda National Library as the assistant reference librarian in 1996 and became the local studies librarian working in the library's collection management department in 1999. Her passion for Bermuda stories, our history, and our diverse cultures has guided her interests as a member of the Bermuda Historical Society Executive and as a Historical Heartbeats Committee member. We welcome you, Ellen, your expertise, and it's over to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. So I'm just tagging on to Mandelis's welcome um, as we are the same department now. So I am from the Bermuda National Library. I am currently sitting at the information desk and we are located on Queen Street, 13 Queen Street in the Palavi building. Yes, we are actually Parleville. Uh, the park has been renamed Queen Elizabeth. If you do not recall where Parleville Park is, it is that wonderful green space um, at the end of Reed Street. <clears throat> So we are here, our hours uh, are a bit variable. We are mostly open at 8.30 to five, Monday to Thursday, 10 to five on Friday, nine to five on Saturday. Uh, there are COVID regulations in play, uh, which are very similar to what is going on at archives. So those uh, restrictions will be about the same if you come to visit us here at, at Queen Street. Uh, Bermuda National Library has been around for a while. This is our most current location. Uh, we've only been here since the 1920s. Um, however, the collection has grown a lot since then. 
And uh, to clarify on that, the materials that is in archives, uh, the original church registers, for example, early Bermuda records, early church registers, um, are at the archives, the original document. They were transcribed and they were published. Physical copies of those books are available both at archives in their reading room and here in the National Library. So if you're doing some very quick dive in to do a little quick research, we can assist you with that. Um, we have several other books that have been published, either from private collection, uh, so very small print runs, such as the Jones Family book. Uh, there are several others that are very small runs that have been, become very valuable in doing further research. Um, so beyond the published documents uh, in physical form for books, we also have access to the local newspapers. Bermuda the National Library has been collecting the Royal Gazette possibly since day one. Uh, we do have a collection that goes back to 1784 and is available on microfilm up to 2019. However, to make life easier for everyone, and during this past year, it has made life very interesting and very helpful for most of our, our patrons. We have the newspapers, uh, a good chunk of them, available online. So the digital collection was launched just over 10 years ago. Uh, we have a, a broad series of periodicals and documents that are, are available there. I'm going to share my screen now, and I will try to slowly go through the key steps of accessing that information. One moment, please. So this screen that I'm sharing now is the Bermuda National Library's website. As you can see, bnl.bm is our address. And when you get there, you simply have to go to the right-hand right -hand side of the page and click on the second button down, which is the digital collection. That, as the computer bounces us right back to the digital collection. <clears throat> this is the main page. This is the page you're going to come into when you hit that button, or you can type in the main address, which is bnl contentvm.oclc.org. Clicking the button is probably faster. The collection includes a, broad, a, a range of interesting social documents. Uh, the Bermuda Beacon, which was the electrical engineer's newsletter from the, the uh, when they were building the base, American base down there in St. David. Um, this was uh, a very short run, little collection there, and we were very happy to have that and upload that for people to look at and get a snapshot of what it was like when they were building that, that, that giant piece of airport, what we call now, yeah. The <clears throat> Bermuda Life and Times is a, is a magazine that was put out. It's mostly a trade development board, tourism-based magazine. Uh, we may be familiar with the newspaper, the Bermuda Recorder, or the Recorder. Uh, it had varying uh, mastheads, depending on when it was being published. Um, it did have two different main editors, um, and the masthead did change. However, we preserve all of them under Bermuda Reporter. As I scroll down the page, you will see we have Bermuda Sports, the, again, short-run Bermuda Times newspaper, 1987 to 1995 a very short run periodical called East Ender, which focused solely on St. George's <laughs> and the East End of the Island. So it included Bailey's Bay and Tucker's Town, but there are only five issues. Of incredible value to us socially and, and um, in, our, in our study of our culture and how we record our culture, Fame Magazine is part of our digital collection. And again, that runs from 1962 to 1966. Um, I have great fun going back in there and looking at the adverts and reading some really fun interviews that were done um, and just learning my history from a different perspective that was never taught in school. The Worker's Voice, uh, which is the last collection there, is uh, almost complete. Uh, we have a collection starting in 1971 with the first original newsletters and then it looms into the more fuller document that we know now. Um, that collection 
uh, continues up to the modern age and is searchable. I would like to show you through the Royal Gazette. As I said, we think the Bermuda National Library has been collecting the Royal Gazette newspaper and we have it from the first issue in 1784. You can click on the link here. Each palette here will take you to a different part of the collection. This one will take you to a little brief description of what the Royal Gazette is. You can click on Browse, and it will try to show you 20,171 records. Those That means issues in this case. And that's for now. That is going to grow again uh, fairly soon. We will have another increase in our, our numbers um, within the month or so. So this is a bit intimidating. When you come to this, you've got this giant screen of just a straight list of papers. It is best to come a little bit more prepared. Um, there is a lot I can show you on how to just dive in there and just you could add any um, general term in this little box here. As you can see, I had done a query for someone on SANS. Um, that would hit an incredibly high number of records. So you would type it in there, you would click the little magnifier there, and you get an extremely high hit. I like when I know what I'm when I know whom I'm looking for to use the advanced search function, which is this little phrase underneath the search bar. You click on that, and it takes you to this wonderful screen. Um, as I'm going to focus on the Royal Gazette, because if I didn't, I would have too many hits again, I'm going to limit the collection by first selecting all collections, so every single one of them is unticked. I can show you all of them here clicking on the Royal Gazette and hitting save at that point. Um, it will not move forward unless you hit save. Um, scrolling down the page um, using either your mouse or your keyboard or uh, utilizing the computer screen in whichever is most comfortable for you, um, you can bring it down to the section that says enter search term. Again, this is the little entry box here in which you can enter what whom you're looking for or what you're looking for. In this case, I'm picking <laughs> Thaddeus, Adolphus, Hollis. And to make sure I get that specific person, I'm going to change the, the type of search to exact phrase. Okay, I'm scrolling down to the third option there. And because I know even that will give me about 98 hits, I'm going to add another modifier and search for oops, uh, Matilda Davis. And again, using exact phrase, and then hitting the search button here. As you can see, I have one hit. I um, wanted to limit it to one because this gets a little bit finicky in trying to show you exactly how to access that document at this point. You can click on the title and the image will, will pop up where that phrase um, where any of those phrases appear. As you can see on the right hand side of the screen, you have another search bar, yet another search bar, with the phrases that I use to find this record. If I click the search function here and go to filtered, the only page that then shows up is the one where that term appears or those term appear, terms appear. <clears throat> As you can see, red highlight on the side here, and then the red highlights within the article or articles. These little 
highlights in the smaller columns are not what I'm looking for. That is actually funnily enough part of the search term here, which is not relevant. You can alter your search terms once you're in this section, in this field here on the right hand column. You can again hit search and only Thaddeus, Adolphus, Paulus, any variation thereof is going to show up. To view this image closer, here on the main image, you will see a blue square expansion box. If you click on that, the image pops up in its own screen. There are several ways to make it bigger. In this case, I simply clicked the image and it jumped to a larger, larger zoom. You can zoom in using the plus or, and zoom out using the minus functions that are here. My apologies for moving so fast. Um, you can move up by clicking on the image and pulling it up with your mouse. Um, you can also enlarge by using your mouse, right click uh, or left click. In this case, it was left click. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, left. <clears throat> and here is Mr. Thaddeus Adolphus Hollis of Crawl. This is his obituary. Um, this is my great grandfather. <laughs> Um, who was nine years old. So here's his little brief story about his life, which is absolutely fantastic. Gives you his wife's name, where, when they got married, gives you his children's names, and a little bit about his life. So this is a really very nicely written obituary. I'd love to know who submitted it. It is, is um, very useful when doing this sort of genealogy. Um, you have extra, extra information in here that will help you find more stories about the family and gives you a bit more of a color to their life other than this is their name, this is their birth date, and this is when they died. Um, you see that you can see what hobbies he had. And um, if he raced against Mr. Henry Masters, um, then there's probably some good stories there in the Masters family talking about those races as well. So there's some a lot of different types of genealogy type of research you can do when you find information like that. Um, this is one way of getting to this information. Um, if I had simply just typed in Thaddeus Adolphus Hollis here in the general search, as I said, oh, in this case, there's only 44 um, entries pop up for him with the, that specific phrase and usage. Um, the joy in my family in, is knowing that Thaddeus Adolphus Hollis was also known as Thad Hollis, Thaddeus Hollis, and occasionally T.A. Hollis. Uh, Mandelis did mention earlier, be very careful when you're doing this type of research when you have similar names. In my family, I know that T.A. and Thad and Thaddeus Hollis is the same for four generations in my family. If I did a search for Thad Hollis for the general collection of all of the documents that are in this digital um, archive, you would get references to all four of the gentlemen in my family. Um, so you can actually, in that case, if I'm just doing Thaddeus Adolphus Hollis, you can actually narrow that down by date. So as you can see, back to advanced search, I have taken out Matilda Davis because I don't need to, to uh, fine tune it to just one record. And I can limit this by a date. And I know, again, because I have a feeling I have a good idea when that he was made a fisheries warden. If I search in, nope, that won't do. <laughs> and in cases like that, I over, overestimated the date. I need to look between 1908 and 1914. 
and see if Thaddeus Adolphus is actually the name he's known as in the newspaper. And that shows that he was not known as Thaddeus Adolphus Olive in the newspaper for those dates. My apologies. So this is this is when you get to have a lot of fun playing back and forth between advanced search, general search, and fine tuning. So I'm going to do the Bad Hollis search between 1908 and 1914 to show you what exactly I meant. <laughs> well, maybe not. So, <clears throat> Thad Hollis is the name for my father in this case, 1943, and his father, 1943 through 1950. 50s. The 1955s, yeah, that's my dad. Um, so I can show you that here. Uh, I can, again, search it, filter it. So it's only the page where Thad Hollis appears comes up. So here we are in May, 1955, expanding the document, double clicking. And you can see that this is a performance of the Players Amateur Operatic Society. And you will see a few names that if you know any of our musicians on island, um, you may recognize and uh, actually love to tell them about themselves later. I know a few of these names here. Um, and here is proof that my dad did sing in the operatic society uh, when he was, oh, a grand total of 20 years old. Um, so to close that document, you just click the X at the top there or hit the escape button. Go back to results. There is a control on the upper right hand side below the masthead and go back to results is there. Um, and to explain why I was giggling, 1943 is a account of my father again um, at MSA as a uh, young elementary school student in grade eight. Um, so Thad Hollis is a term that I can I can research for my father. Um, later on, if I was looking in the other collections, I know my brother shows up in Worker's Voice. He is also a Thad Hollis. Um, if I'd done, there there are other many, many articles about um, T.A. Hollis, and there are um, a slew of other articles that just, if you just type in the word Hollis, do not um, be surprised to get everything. And um, every single advert, every single letter unclaimed, um, which will pop up because the newspaper contains the list of unclaimed letters. Verugza is great for that. That is when, uh, that's one source I use actually when I'm researching people that we can't find a footprint for. We know this person was here. We can prove they were here because people were sending them mail and their mail was at the post office and had not been collected. So it was published that their, their name was on a list saying, hey, your mail's here. Um, we've been able to prove that people were supposed to be on island or were thought to have been on island, or maybe the mail missed them by a month, but it's the right time period. Um, so that gives you some satisfaction in when you're trying to track down what time period people were actually out and about in Bermuda. Um, that is one part of the newspaper, which doesn't seem very satisfying when you first look at it, but if you can put it in that context, that not everyone is going to have that footprint. Um, there are articles that I'm not showing you right now where my grand, great grandfather is mentioned because one of his children has had an accident. So there's a newspaper article about that. There's another article where someone um, forged his signature. So there's a court case. So it's not really about him so much as about the other gentleman who was the one who needed to, who felt he needed to forge that signature to do what he needs to do. Um, but it's an incidental story that can be spun into something um, much more interesting to give you context of what life was like. Mm -hmm. um, there are several other um, wonderful stories that can come out of this. My family was involved in the Department of Agriculture 
And so there's lots of signatures on official reports. So when I do that search, I get a lot of those agricultural reports coming up for my grandfather and for his father, my great grandfather, all under Thad, T.A. or T. Arthur Hollis. So it's um, a broad range of material that that can um, be there for that. I just want to jump in, Ellen, uh, just in the interest of time. Yep. Um, it's a, I mean, all of the story is excellent and yep. educative and your demonstration is extremely helpful. I'm just concerned in terms of, I know you wanted to, to talk a little bit about what the National Library is offering in terms of individuated uh, research assistance. Yes, um, for certain. If anyone does need help, we are here um, again. The staff can assist with the queries that come in. If it's a published document, then we will find that for you if we can and uh, make sure we get that access for you. If it is the digital collection, um, we can show you the basic information. And coming up in April during National Library Week, I will be um, allowing appointments. Um, the advertisement for that will go out shortly. I'm sure there's going to be some uh, information in the chat that will actually help with that. Um, I will be doing one-on-ones, just like what we've done just now, uh, with individuals while they, they um, search for their information. Um, hoping for genealogy, if it's, um, and it, genealogy can be anything. It can be geographical genealogy, where you're looking for what the St. George's look like during this time mm -hmm. period, to, okay, which TA Hollis am I looking for? Mm -hmm. um, so, no, that's excellent, and I, I, I'm imagining that with the 125 people that are here today, or just about, oh. uh, you may be oversubscribed. So, careful what you wish for. Um, um, and I've just had a question from Lana Young. She was actually asking uh, because that sort of question too. You know, if I don't have all of the details, what should I do? So, here's an opportunity for uh, for Lana and her family perhaps to meet with you. So, um, if you want to put that information, if I don't know if that was a uh, a slide or if that's you could pop that into um, the chat where we're sharing resources that'd be terrific Ellen thank you so much okay thank you very much sorry for taking so long no you're fine this isn't a it isn't a fast uh, it isn't a fast pitch game um, and uh, and trying to demonstrate exactly how people can actually find their way uh, through and navigate the website you've just done the best thing which is to show uh, to show what happened in real time we're mm -hmm. going to now jump to Jane Downing Jane first came to work at the then named Bermuda Maritime Museum in the 1970s as a summer student, later becoming the curator, a position which could encompass everything from shoveling rubble and doing archeological drawings to cataloging the collections and producing exhibitions. She later worked at the government archives as a records officer, and then subsequently returned to the National Museum of Bermuda in 2005 as registrar. Welcome Jane. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to be sharing, I'm going to be talking about um, genealogical papers and genealogical research. And I'm just going to share my presentation. Okay, I'm going to be talking about um, one element of um, genealogical research material that we have here at the museum and its research papers. Um, these research papers are essentially the culmination of research that people have done into the sources that uh, Mandelis has at the archives, the original records he was talking about, the published material that Ellen has been covering part of at the National Library, and the family interviews that um, Kenyatta Berry discussed in the first part of this um, series. So um, if you've been doing any genealogical research at all, you have in fact begun to accumulate um, some genealogical research papers. You might have uh, family trees, um, you could have family group sheets, which are like little family unit records. Um, you might have note, a notebook, you might have uh, source material such as photos and letters. Um, and there are, there are groups of papers in archives and libraries um, around the world and in people's homes that, uh, that um, are the result of people 
looking up their families. Sometimes it's published. I think Ellen touched on that when she mentioned the Jones family. There's also a, a book about the Watlingtons that's been published. Um, but sometimes people who've done family histories um, have a few copies printed up and spiral ground and put them at the archives or the library. So um, sometimes if you ask what family histories they have, you may come across something that um, isn't widely known about that uh, another researcher has um, added to their shelves. Um, and needless to say, um, a lot of genealogical research is to be found on sites such as Family Search and Ancestry. Um, so what is the advantage of, uh, or disadvantages, of using someone else's um, research when you're doing your own family tree, your own family history? Um, well, it can save you a lot of time. Um, you don't have to go to all the different places, the different sources, the online stuff, down to the archives, etc. cetera. Um, and it can also uh, include information you can't lay your hands on easily, such as private papers, information from places like um, the National Archives of the, in the UK and that sort of thing. Um, so it can really be an immense time saver and sometimes it can solve some little problems you have, such as how many Thaddeus Hollis's there are in your family and how they're related to each other. Maybe somebody else has had that same problem and they've uh, dived in and, and managed to untangle it all. Um, I know in the Lightborn family years ago, I remember coming across an incredible number of Joseph Lightborns. Um, so a similar type of problem where an uncle was younger than his nephew and that sort of thing. Um, there are some disadvantages of, of looking through other people's research. Um, they may not have cited where they got the information or the information they have may not line up with what you have. Um, so when you're looking through the material, you need to think to yourself, you know, if this is different, is, you know, is there a reason? Does either of these supposed facts make, does one make more sense than the other? How does this look in the context of the other information I have? And, and you need to constantly document what you're finding. So you need to be sure to say that in um, uh, Mr. Jones' research, he says that Anna was born in 1835 but the information that you have says she was born in 1845. So you need to write all of that down so that you can refer back and eventually perhaps tease the truth out from these odd pieces of information. Uh, at the museum, we have a major collection of genealogical research papers, um, which were bequeathed to us by their creator, um, Clara Hollis Hallett, who was a genealogist and um, she worked in genealogy for decades and um, accumulated um, a huge number of, of, of papers uh, in the course of answering family history inquiries. Um, and along the way, she and her husband indexed um, a number of church records, wills, um, protests, and other um, original documents that uh, can help in genealogical inquiry. And I'll just touch on, on those at the end of my presentation because those indexes are available. Anyway, what Mrs. Hallett did was she um, created surname files. There are over 650 of them. Um, they are available on the National Museum website and you can actually go on the website, look under genealogy research and search for free to see if there are any hits on any of your family members. If there are and you wanna find out more, um, you do have to become a member to see the full records. Um, Mrs. Hallett's information, as I said, is organized by surname. So each surname file um, contains a number of family groups. Family group is usually, typically, 
a husband and a wife and their children. Um, so it's a sort of a unit. Um, it may just be a woman and her children, or it may be a man who is married twice, so two family groups. Um, when you first open a surname file, you'll find it contain it can contain anywhere from one to over 200 family groups. So you're going to be faced with page after page of um, Smiths marrying Jones or Smiths marrying Darrells or Smiths marrying Lightborns um, and so forth. The Smith surname file has over 250 such groups. So you'll be looking through for people that you know are in your family to begin with. You know, maybe your grandparents, maybe your great grandparents or something. And once you begin to get a handle on those people you're looking for, you can start to link them to other groups in the surname file. A family group um, information may include birth, baptism, marriage, death, burial records, uh, and notes about related records. Um, this is an example uh, from the Darrell family, Henry Harvey Darrell and Susan Ann Lambert Darrell. This is their family group sheet. Um, it gives you where known the dates of their um, birth and their death. Their marriage is in the middle here. Um, Mrs. Hallett has given her sources um, for Henry Harvey's death. She's got a Registry General record, a Royal Gazette obituary, and the number 18, which refers to a church record. Um, it gives the names of their children and their dates of birth and sometimes baptism. Um, one of them married, Herman Fraser Harvey married Elmira Gertrude Winslow Mouchette. Um, once again, she's um, here. She gives Herman Fraser Darrell's birth as 1862. And she gives the source for that information, which is that he was age 22 at his marriage in 1884. So where she has a piece of information, she tries to always cite where she found it or how she came to that conclusion. Henry Harvey Darrell was widowed in 1878 and he subsequently married again. So there's a second family group sheet for him. Um, he married Letitia Ann Balfour and that continues on to another page. They had one child and um, the, um, there were a couple of notes of further information which gives a little bit more information about Henry Harvey Dowell's um, employment, cause of his death, names of his parents. Um, and in one will, he refers to his reputed son, Henry Darrell, or someone refers to his reputed son, Henry Darrell, and his sons, Richard and Harvey. So this is quite a lot of information. You can go from, from these, um, group sheets that Mrs. Hallett has made up, you could go back to the original records, you could go to the archives and look at the will in volume 26 of the Book of Wills, page 162, and see the actual will of Thomas Darrell of Devonshire in case there's something further you can glean from that. Um, they're very, very useful. Um, so you have a surname file for the Smiths or the Darrells or the Joneses. And it's got all these family groups in it. And then at the very end, whenever Mrs. Hallett found somebody who didn't fit in with anything else, she added them as a miscellaneous note. So this is from the painter surname document. And at the end, these are all people who she can't match to anybody uh, in a family group, but they are mentioned here and there. So um, Alice Clarinda Maud Painter um, is listed because um, there's a death record for her. 
uh, says she's the daughter of Anne Taylor, but she's not any of the painters in Mrs. Um, Hallett's family groups. And sometimes you can find somebody here who at the time that Mrs. Hallett was doing her research didn't fit in with anybody else. Um, Mrs. Hallett did meticulously document her sources. She has an abbreviations guide to them, to her sources. And you'll see over here on the um, lower right, some of the sources um, such as uh, court records, uh, collodial records, composite volumes. These are, um, I think, what Mandelas was referring to in the archives, deeds, bonds, bills, and protests, um, Royal Gazette, Registry General. She refers, Mrs. in these documents, Mrs. Hallett uses microfilm numbers to refer to church records and Turks and Caicos records. So these are the microfilm numbers at the Bermuda archives. So if you go down there to actually look at a microfilm of a church record, um, you'll be able to go straight from Mrs. Hallett's um, genealogy research papers to the microfilm number without having to look it up. Um, as with any other collection of uh, genealogical research, um, just keep in mind that it reflects what was available at the time the research was carried out. The researcher may have interpreted the handwriting incorrectly, or uh, the handwriting they were looking at may have been an interpretation of a spoken name as written down by a minister. So um, keeping in mind um, when you're looking through things that spelling can vary an enormous amount and that what you're looking at in someone else's research is not necessarily every single piece of information. It's what they were able to find. Um, I hope you'll go online to our, our website and check out the Hallett papers. Um, we do also uh, accept inquiries um, about items in our main collections, but I will say that what we have for genealogists outside of the Hallett papers is somewhat limited. We don't have um, many groups of um, original primary records and we um, and photographs and family documents tend to be hit or miss depending on who's donated what to the museum. Um, we do have um, research databases for war vets and some um, British convicts as well as for uh, shipwrecks and a lot of local ships and boats. So if you think that um, information on military or uh, maritime matters might be of use to you, um, try contacting us through our website. Um, the other thing we have to offer are publications. We have available the um, indexes to church records and wills which um, Dr. and Mrs. Hallett compiled. Um, they're on our website. Um, they're available as PDFs. Um, the church records, uh, church and clergy records start as early as 1619 and go up to um, 1913. And the wills start in 1629 and go up to 1913. So, um, these are really useful because um, if you get the PDF, you can do your research at home and find, find the reference. And then if you want to consult um, and take a look at the microfilm of the original document, you can head on down to the archives. Um, we also have a PDF of the civil records of Bermuda, 1612 to 1684, which is um, all the uh, official documents of of Bermuda, which include all sorts of information about court cases and um, lists of taxpayers and all sorts of things like that, which can be useful if you're looking for someone in that first um, Bermuda company period. Um, 
I'm going to wind up my presentation now. Um, here are some links, which um, you can find the genealogical papers uh, on our website. You can find a form for um, inquiries on the website as well. Um, you can go to the shop for publications and you can uh, join if you decide you want to look further at the genealogical papers, you can join on the membership page. Uh, so that wraps up my presentation and um, I'll return you back to Lisa. Thank you, Jane. And, and one of the comments from a participant is, you know, this is a lot of information. Um, you're absolutely right, Frances Eddy, and, uh, and, the, and the instruction she's asking for in order to be able to use the digital collections, uh, maybe a direct call to Ellen at the library. Um, it might also really kind of almost become a, a case of uh, do and practice. I do want to jump into a couple of questions. I'm realizing that some participants have had to drop off, um, but I want to go back to the very beginning with the, William Packwood's question about asking if he can get a copy of an item in the colonial records. I'm not sure, is that from Mandela's? Um, what question was that? Specifically how can William what? Packwood get a copy of an item in the colonial records? How can he get a copy of an item? Well, um, what what item exactly is is he is he looking for? It? Okay, well then we'll leave it there, and I'll leave it then if he's still with us for William to contact uh, either Mandela's or the library or the National Museum, or just pop it into one email and we can circulate it. We're just talking offline here on on how we're going to answer to so many of these questions. Um, because they're all valid and very interesting. And so we're going to try to solution that and, and make sure that all of the people who've come today do get both the questions and answers, um, and we'll circulate that. Um, Jamila Ferries asked at the beginning as well, are there any plans to make the archived records publicly accessible um, online through the gov.bm site, Mandela's? Um, we are currently working, I, I, I believe my answer, I should have put it live. Um, we are currently digitizing a lot of the collection um, that is related to genealogy. A lot of those uh, wheels have been uh, digitized. Um, the slavery re slave registers are digitized. Um, the, we have uh, digital copies of some of the Bowen's protests. Uh, and I am, we are working with the library um, to see if we can jump on their portal um, to make those accessible. So give us about, say, six to nine months to see where we come up with that, and then we'll make that, pub we'll, pu we'll publicly post that they're available on a particular, on the, I don't know what part of the portal that will be, okay. um, but we are in discussions of getting that done. That's terrific. And I'm sorry for um, not seeing that you had made some answers to those questions. Um, I don't know if I saw an answer yet to Vanessa Blake's question regarding the yellow fever outbreak of 1853 and whether or not there was a mass or an individual grave site um, and how she can get some information about a family member. That one's a bit difficult. Um, yellow fever is a tricky one. Um, there are some tombstones that are um, been transcribed and recorded in um, it's a Dasha Museum book, um, the Bermuda Memorial Inscriptions. Yeah, it is a museum book. Yeah, it's their book. It's your book. Yeah, um, yeah. But unfortunately, that particular uh, lady is not listed. She's not doesn't have a, a tribute stone to her. Um, so she is not in the index. So that doesn't mean she didn't die here during yellow fever. It just means that there's no tombstone or plaque with her name on it. Um, there are graves that exist without tombstones. Unfortunately, that is part of history and what happens when uh, we live in a world where limestone and granite dissolve in rain and there's hurricanes and there's vandalism and there's all sorts of wonderful natural disasters that can happen. Um, for her name, I we do have some records of the yellow fevers. We have reports. They don't always name people. There's usually more statistical information in the government reports from those time periods. 
Um, I have a lot of the yellow fever reports um, in our in our rare book collection at the library. I think Mandelis has some of them as well at the archives. Um, we do have duplicate sets for that very reason. Um, we back up the archives on some of the documents as well. But I might be able to find something in the digital collection. She may have been mentioned in the newspaper. There may have been a card of thanks, or there may have been a some sort of note that was in the paper from the regiment, um, maybe with her arriving or leaving, I'm sorry, her arriving or her husband leaving the island um, being transferred out. So there may be a way to pinpoint um, the time but an actual finding the actual grave is going to be a lot more difficult. Thank you. Another question, uh, this came from Lauren Adams and apologies if it's been um, replied to already. She was asking about prints from the microfiche if they're available to purchase and how much? Um, with the scan pro, um, with this printing from the, our new scan pro, that's, that's what it's called, right? LMB. Yes, from, from digital, that microfilm. microfilm it's, it, it's much easier to print uh, onto paper. It's clearer. Um, you can also put, because it's digital, you can put those records directly onto a thumb drive. Um, we are not charging if you use a thumb drive, but we are charging. We recently updated our photocopying fees to mirror the libraries. So what are we at? Um, 25 cents a copy now? 50 cents a page. 50 cents a page. 50 cents a page. Yes. A little uh, bit more than when I was at university, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that's a still here putting on a thumb drive, though. Yep, yeah. so thumb drive is free, uh, as, as well as any uh, yeah. modern phone that has a camera. We don't, okay. we don't charge for, but you can, you can take images of, of any of the original records um, that are available to the public um, with, a, with a phone. Many of our nice. researchers actually use their phones to, to photograph countless pages. Okay, and thank you. And download them later on. Okay. I have two questions from Joan Hennahan. Um, she wanted to know uh, about her family, the Lightborns, and whether or not the Lightborns are actually all related. Um, and I know that's more specific. It might need to be, Joan, it might need to be a one-on-one -on -one with Ellen. Uh, but she also wanted to know if, uh, Je um, um, Jane, if the museum is calling for family Bibles to be shared as a repository objects for family histories. Uh, we haven't, but I think that's a great idea. Um, certainly, we have a couple of family Bibles in the collections already that have come via various routes, and um, they do often contain information that's that's not available elsewhere. Um, you know, if a family member was lost at sea or something like that, and it may not have been mentioned in the newspaper, and there may not have been a local death or burial, you can often find that in a family Bible or what happened to people who emigrated abroad. Um, so I think that's a wonderful idea. And I think if anybody wants to uh, share or donate family Bibles, either to the museum or probably to uh, the archives, depending on their capacity, I, I think it's a very, very good idea. Thanks for suggesting. Yeah, it was an interesting point that was raised um, in my interview this morning with the captain on Ocean 89. He was talking about the Bible becoming a resource for his family. And then I, and then my mother and I were speaking about she's looking now for her family Bible that also has the same. So um, my apologies to those who are still firing away questions. Uh, we will address those. And, and as I said, uh, revert back. I'm conscious of now we have... Um, uh, we've lost a chunk of our participants, and I think that signals that there's um, other things to do this evening, including having dinner. So I want to thank you all very much for participating, and that I do hope, trust that this uh, event has been useful, it's that it will attend to your research needs, where you are, are, nat are at now, and that because it will be recorded and available online, you can come back and return to this and sort of skip ahead to the section that you felt was most 
most valuable for you. I want to thank our participants and the time that it takes to put together a presentation and your time this evening to present with us and then the further takeaway to help us make sure we've answered all our questions um, and we can send those back out to our community. So thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you very much to the team in the background, uh, Dr. Deborah Atwood and Katie Bennett, uh, making sure we've got ourselves organized by tech and by communication. And I just want to say thank you very much to everyone who's come on board and joined us this evening. Hopefully we'll see you next month when we have a team of powerful women visiting us from the Smithsonian Institution. And they are going to take us into looking closely at how objects found objects in the, uh, in the United States of America actually helped to create the collection of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, as well as to take us through the journey of how those objects relate to genealogy um, and, and really give us some tools from their perspective. Hey, maybe down the road, we can all go and visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture as a Tracing Our Roots group, and uh, that would be exciting. I'm just gonna send that out to the universe. So thanks everyone and all the very best.